Welcome to the University of Manitoba Alumni and Friends Virtual Learning for Life series. This is our sixth session of a total of nine weeks. My name is Tracy Bowman and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and a proud UM alumna and will be the moderator for today. Thank you for joining us and making this event part of your day and in general for choosing to stay connected with your alma mater in this way. We have been able to offer this program free of charge to all of our 145,000 alumni living in 140 countries around the world, thanks to the very generous sponsorship of one of our affinity partners, IA Financial. Many thanks to them. Delivering learning for life opportunities is a very important role for the University of Manitoba. And we're so proud that we're able to showcase many of our leading professors and researchers in this way. Now, just a few housekeeping details before I present today's speaker. You are viewing this web webinar in, in a YouTube link and you will see both of our presenter and as well as his PowerPoint presentation. Today's session, like previous sessions, will be recorded and posted on our website within about a day or so. You were also sent a link to Slido. That website is www.sli.do and the password VL10. And that's what we will be using to facilitate the Q&A. So I encourage you to enter your questions there and then I will be reading them out to our presenter and we will get through as many as we can. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Jason Kinderchuk, who will be presenting on COVID-19, the emergence and spread of a pandemic in the age of social media. Now, just a bit about Dr. Kinderchuk. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases at the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. And he holds a tier two Canada research chair in molecular pathogenesis of emerging and re-emerging viruses. He has a broad expertise and interest in emerging viruses and outbreak outbreak preparedness in both developing and developed nations. His research focuses on the investigation of emerging virus circulation, transmission, and pathogenesis, and in particular, those viruses that pose the greatest threat to global human and animal health. He's also served on multiple expert committees with the World Health Organization, and he's actively participated in media outreach locally, nationally, and internationally, and you may in a number of these media reports citing Dr. Kinderchuk's expertise on UM Today. So with that, over to you, Dr. Kinderchuk. Great, Th thank you so much, Tracy, and, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, hopefully everybody has not gotten too tired of uh, hearing my voice or, or hearing my words about COVID-19, uh, but that's what happens when uh, you're one of very few virologists that, uh, that are willing to still take uh, media interviews during a, during a pandemic. Um, so, you know, really today what I want to do is, is cover uh, some basic information about COVID-19, but also talk a little bit about what, you know, what we do know and what we really don't know at this time period and where misinformation and disinformation, um, you know, kind of plays into this. In particular, since this is really the first pandemic uh, where we have truly been in the age of social media and where social media really predominates um, our ability to, to get news uh, and, uh, and updates and data. Um, whether you're a member of the general public or you're a member of the scientific uh, research or, or clinical community. So with that, let, let's talk a little bit about viruses and, and talk about emerging infectious disease. So this figure, I'm just going to put up my pointer for you. So this figure is from ProMed uh, and the International Society for Infectious Diseases. Um, and this was basically a report that was done from July to September 2019 really highlighting, uh, you know, the different infectious diseases uh, that, uh, you know, that were being, um, you know, battled or, or uh, that, you know, were, um, you know, predominating in different regions of the world. Now, the size of the words uh, and the, the location don't specifically define how large uh, an outbreak is um, or uh, the specific location. So Ebola here is designating that there is an ongoing Ebola outbreak in, in the DRC. Um, same thing with polio up into, uh, you know, North Central uh, Africa. Um, but it doesn't necessarily tell us, uh, you, know, what, uh, you know, what the overall toll of those diseases in the region is. But what we can see is that this picture is, is extremely complicated. Uh, and that gives us an idea of what, what we're battling as virologists, as researchers, as clinicians, um, you know, who focus on infectious diseases on, on a daily basis. Now we fast forward to 2020, 
uh, in the period from January to March. And what we see is obviously the, the distinct change. Um, COVID-19 uh, has really taken over uh, everything. But what I think we, we really need to keep perspective of and maintain perspective of is the fact that while uh, COVID-19 is, is really what uh, you know, is predominating the, the news headlines uh, and, and is on our minds, um, we are still battling infectious diseases uh, across the globe. And in particular, um, you know, the regions of the world that, uh, that I tend to you know, do a lot of work in, uh, mostly in, in West and Central Africa, um, the DRC right now has uh, two uh, ongoing outbreaks of, of Ebola that are not related to one another. Um, so when we think about you know, just the, the sheer amount of stress that infectious diseases uh, exert upon us, um, you know, my, my statement to people is always that this is a battle that I don't think we are ever going to win. It's one that we are merely trying to, uh, to subside for as long as we can. Now, this slide, I, you know, I've, I've debated pretty much for the past seven, well, probably you know, six or seven months, whether to continue to show it, uh, in particular because of the, the time period that we are currently in uh, with, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. But I think it, it harkens back to you know, statements that, uh, that, that many of us have been making for a long period of time. And for myself, um, you know, I've been involved in, in emerging and re-emerging viruses uh, for you know, 13 years now. Um, we constantly talk about the idea that we truly aren't ready for the next pandemic. Uh, and I think in a lot of cases, you know, people have uh, maybe assumed that we were, you know, kind of um, highlighting the doom and gloom aspect because that's where our research focus is. And, and in fact, WHO a couple of years ago actually put together a working group, which was the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. And they were an independent monitoring and accountability body that basically was, was put in place to try and examine whether or not, as a global community, we were actually prepared for, for an incoming pandemic. And ultimately, what they found was we, we, we are not, and we were not. Um, and most of that came down to seven urgent actions uh, that, uh, that were identified that were critical for us to be able to, uh, to combat a, a, new, uh, a new pandemic. It was a, a virus that was re-emerging or one that was newly emerging. And it came down to really four key points that in my opinion, that I think are, are the most distinct. Um, the first being that heads of government uh, have to commit and invest. Um, I do uh, a tremendous amount of work uh, across Africa and, and in areas that are completely, completely resource limited. Um, these areas, uh, unfortunately, are the most vulnerable to, uh, to emerging viruses and emerging infectious diseases. Um, and they are really our weakest link in, in the chain to be able to battle these diseases globally. So, um, you know, I think this is a really critical point for us to think about the fact that uh, as a global community and one that is, uh, is interlinked um, undoubtedly uh, in 2020, uh, we need to be able to, to invest and build up the infrastructure uh, and the expertise um, in the most vulnerable regions of the world if we ever expect uh, to be able to uh, combat infectious diseases as they emerge. Um, countries and regional organizations have to lead by example. Um, there's no debate about that. We, we need to have uh, countries in place that are willing to kind of lead the charge. I think Canada has uh, done an immaculate job uh, of that. In, you know, in particular, my own department, uh, Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, has been doing this with HIV for decades now. Um, and our department, in conjunction with the Public Health Agency of Canada, um, have been doing this uh, you know, globally for other infectious diseases, including Ebola. Um, but we also need uh, other regions of the world, in particular, um, you know, regions uh, or countries associated with, you know, say, the, uh, the, the G7, uh, to be able to uh, stand up and help lead the charge. Um, all countries have to build strong systems, so we need to have monitoring systems that are in place, and we need to have some amount of coordination uh, between those countries uh, to, to be able to, to combat infectious diseases. And ultimately, countries, donors, and multilateral institutions have to be prepared for the worst. Uh, all of these points, I think we can go through and we can look at and basically put big red X's beside to say this is how um, we weren't prepared for, for COVID-19. Um, and, and that's the unfortunate uh, position that, that I think we found ourselves in. And, and uh, you know, we've, we've said this for years now, um, you know, coming out of SARS, uh, coming out of 2009 uh, influenza uh, through the, the H1N1 pandemic, um, coming out of uh, the West African Ebola epidemic, um, that we needed to, uh, as a global community, um, I you know really identify uh, these areas of need 
uh, and circumvent those. And I think we are still at an infancy in actually doing that. So what, what is it that I do? And, and where, kind of where do I fall into in a picture of emerging infectious diseases? Um, really what I'm trying to and have been trying to establish, uh, you know, whether, whether rightfully or wrongfully um, over the past uh, three and a half years now here in Winnipeg, and then, uh, you know, during my prior time when I was still at uh, the National Institutes of Health in, in Washington, D.C., is really trying to integrate what we call uh, One Health Approaches to Emerging Infectious Disease. And I know this slide is a little bit busy, um, but really when I'm talking about this idea of One Health, it's really trying to integrate human and animal health along with environmental health. And I know that when, uh, you know, when I've talked a little bit about environment, uh, environmental health in the past, um, you know, people immediately, I, I think, um, start to think, you know, are, are we talking just about, um, you know, trying to just try to preserve the environment? Um, you know, are we just talking about climate change? Well, yeah, no, they're, they're all interlinked. But what we have to think about is ultimately, humans and animals in terms of our health are ultimately linked back to our environment. Um, and what we know, especially with the types of, uh, of viruses in, in infectious diseases that, that I work with, um, we know that there is a link in between contact of humans with, with animals that carry these diseases. And what we do know is that that contact um, is basically being increased uh, in a del uh, deleterious fashion uh, or in a negative fashion um, by changes in our surrounding environment. I'll kind of walk through a, a little bit of that. So when we think about this idea of things like climate change, um, you know, ultimately, I think, you know, again, we look back at the, the scientific community, I think pretty much everybody in the scientific community at this point um, predominantly agrees that that climate change is occurring. Um, but what we need to start to think about is how climate change uh, is actually having an effect on our surrounding environment. Um, and Dr. Ian McKay uh, from Australia had actually put uh, this, this wonderful figure together. Um, Ian is one of, uh, one of many friends that I have now gained on, on social media through Twitter. My, uh, the other Dr. Kinderchuk in my household, who is, uh, I think vastly more talented than I am. Um, I've told her many times that, uh, you know, once I hit the age of 40, I'm, I'm at an age where I likely will not gain lifelong friends in person. Um, but social media has afforded me that ability to, uh, to make friends that I, I don't necessarily have to, to see all the time. Um, and I think other people feel the same way. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, but Ian put together this, this amazing figure and it really talked about the idea of how climate change is affecting uh, essentially this interaction of us as humans uh, or even wildlife with infectious diseases. And what we can think about is the fact that um, without going through all the specific examples, climate change ultimately is, is changing uh, the dynamic of how we inter interact uh, at the interface of, uh, of infectious diseases. And really what we need to start to understand is how to essentially try to mitigate um, many of these uh, interactions so that we can try and, and reduce uh, the amount of infectious disease spillover uh, that, that we're finding, but also um, to try and better understand what types of, um, uh, you know, I guess safe checks we can put in place to try and reduce the amount of spillover that we see. So, you know, again, I'll refer back a lot to Ebola um, because that, that really is what got me into research in the first place. Um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo right now, we know that there has been a second outbreak of Ebola uh, within the country. And uh, all data right now points to the fact that this is a, what we call a new spillover. So the virus has basically spilled over from uh, wildlife, uh, likely bats into humans. Um, can we start to understand, um, you know, how climate change is driving some of those interactions? Because what we're seeing ultimately is that many of these, uh, what we call zoonotic uh, infectious diseases, so diseases that spill over from animals into humans, um, what we're seeing is a general increase uh, over the past couple of decades. And that increase uh, correlates very well with, with climate change. And there's actually been some pretty good studies that have shown causation uh, between those events. So I, I think we need to start to, to put those into perspective. And the reason why these things are important is that when we think about the idea of infectious diseases, and in particular zoonotic diseases uh, that basically are spilling over uh, directly from animals um, into humans, what we need to understand is that first of all, all animals are not equal. 
Um, and, and that's one of the things that really makes, uh, I think, my area of research interesting, but also extremely difficult. So if we think about things like Ebola, and, and we'll talk about coronaviruses and COVID-19 uh, pretty quickly in the talk, um, we think that these viruses uh, basically persist in bats. And what that means is that bats uh, are carrying these viruses naturally, um, but don't show signs of uh, basically uh, of disease or any signs or symptoms of, of illness when they're infected. So we refer to them as basically being a reservoir. The problem with this is that bats uh, essentially are kind of a, a you know nature's perfect reservoir. I, I love bats. I think that they're amazingly cute, um, especially the, the the larger fruit bats. Um, but they carry they carry some pretty horrible diseases. Obviously, we know things like rabies, um, Nipah virus, Hendra virus. Um, we think uh, SARS coronavirus two, which causes COVID nineteen, other coronaviruses, and uh, and Ebola viruses. Um, but what we what we don't really understand is why bats are so good at carrying these diseases. Um, and this has been for a few reasons. I mean, one, it's it's difficult to do work with bats. Um, there aren't that many labs in the world that can actually work with live bats um, within their facilities. Um, we also have a difficulty with trying to get different types of, of reagents or testing uh, kits to be able to use on bats that are specific for those animals. So our understanding has actually been, uh, you know, I think fairly rudimentary. Uh, in terms of how bats play into in, into this role, but the problem for us is that bats, you know, bats unfortunately are pivotal for us being able to combat uh, many of of the worst infectious diseases, uh, or at least many of the worst uh, emerging viruses that we see. And ultimately, what can happen is that those viruses can spill over, um, in some cases, to what we call intermediate hosts. So we think about things like SARS coronavirus. Um, this goes back to this idea of wet markets and in animal markets. Um, some animals can actually be infected uh, by these uh, different viruses when they spill over from uh, from bats, but they don't show the same level of disease that we as, as humans do. So a good example of this is when we look at MERS coronavirus, so Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. At some point in the past, um, bats uh, basically came into contact with camels. Uh, and that virus spilled over into camels. Now that vi MERS coronavirus in camels, I know that this is a pig, um, but let's just pretend for a second. Um, MERS coronavirus in uh, in camels actually produces a, a cold-like illness, kind of like what um, some of the uh, the more mild coronaviruses do in humans. So they essentially get, get the sniffles and get a runny nose. Well, what we think happened is that at some point, that virus basically gained the ability as it was circulating in camels to jump over from that intermediate host in humans and, and cause a pretty devastating disease that kills about 30 to 40% of the people that it infects. So really what we're trying to understand is the dynamic of how all these interactions um, occur in real time, but at the same time trying to understand how all of this happens at the molecular level. So, you know, how does the virus spill over from an animal, but then when it gets inside of us, what happens when it infects a cell? How does it basically, you know, usurp uh, or undermine and, and trick our immune system to be able to allow itself to create, you know, millions upon millions of copies of itself and cause, you know, fairly devastating disease in many cases? So my work uh, now pretty much, you know, spans most of uh, Central Africa. Um, I will always have uh, a program in, in West Africa, and I'll kind of get to some slides for the reason being, uh, but I have programs in Sierra Leone. Um, I'm working in uh, in Gabon, as well as in Republic of Congo, um, and just basically started up some new, um, uh, some new collaborations with folks out of uh, uh, UC Davis uh, in Rwanda to be able to look at, uh, at gorilla populations there. And of course, we're trying to do uh, work in the DRC as well. And ultimately, again, it's this idea of trying to look at the interface of humans uh, with, uh, you know, with different animal species, uh, but also taking into account uh, the, the effects of the environment surrounding that. So, you know, where, how, where and how did I kind of get into COVID-19 and why, why do people maybe seek me out for, for media interviews? I, listen, I'm still trying to understand a lot of that myself. Um, I appreciate it, uh, but uh, you know, chalk it up to growing up in, in Saskatchewan uh, for for you know trying to remain as humble as possible. Um, but really, my my interest in the idea of emerging infectious diseases 
as it relates back to, um, you know, say building capacity at the local level uh, in, in vulnerable regions and as well trying to understand how we can better identify methods to, to treat and provide support for patients. That all came about in 2014. Um, so I was in uh, in Frederick, Maryland, so about 40 miles north of Washington, D.C., um, and we knew that the West African Ebola epidemic was picking up steam. Um, the U.S. government at that point asked for people to volunteer to go and provide direct support on the ground uh, in Liberia, which was at that point one of the hardest hit countries uh, during the West African Ebola epidemic. Um, so I volunteered at the start of August, so the end of the first week of August 2014, and I was on a plane uh, three weeks later which was actually my first trip to, to Africa. Um, so I went from basically the integrated research facility in Frederick uh, to the Liberian Institute for Biomedical Research, which was actually a, a malaria diagnostic center, but had been retrofitted uh, to, to be able to, uh, to look at Ebola samples. Um, I showed this figure on the right because that's really what we're looking at when we think about emerging infectious diseases uh, in resource limited regions. So this is one of the uh, one of the first pictures I took when I got to Liberia. Uh, this is Elwa three. So this is the largest um, uh, tent hospital site that was set up in West Africa for being able to combat um, Ebola virus disease. Uh, and these are patients that are waiting to get access into Elwa 3. So this was the first week of September. Uh, beds were already full within that facility. And what happened daily as we drove by this, this facility daily to, to go to, uh, to our own diagnostic facility is that we saw more and more people that were lining up. The unfortunate side was that many of the people that were lining up uh, would, uh, would die by the time they were, uh, they were getting close to, to being admitted. Um, but we also saw that many people that had early symptoms of disease or people that were uh, loved ones that were caring for people that were ill um, were also in, in you know, fairly close contact with these patients. So it, it really you know, kind of created um, a, a pretty awful situation uh, in terms of disease transmission. Um, but it, it, it harkens back, like I said, to this idea of uh, you know, where we're, we're kind of missing the boat in terms of being able to combat diseases in different regions. Um, you know, so I basically had my team uh, that, that was getting blood samples from around uh, around Liberia, and it was a team of uh, a couple of Americans and myself, uh, but as well Liberian researchers um, who uh, just did the, the, uh, an amazing job uh, of work with us. Um, and when we think about this idea of how to combat infectious disease, you know, a lot of times I try to contrast this uh, you know, with our current situation in, in Winnipeg, uh, in Manitoba, where we're reducing social distancing measures and everybody has kind of gotten tired, uh, you know, of, of this idea of having to, um, to remain isolated or remain locked down to what basically living conditions are in, in different areas of the world. Um, so during a, you know, during an Ebola epidemic, um, you know, these are the things that, that we're combating. And these are the same things that they're combating right now with COVID-19. Um, most people are living on a day-to-day -day wage. Uh, so these are actually locals that were coming to our lab to sell us uh, fresh game that they had hunted. Uh, that included dried bat, um, which uh, on on these plates that they're carrying uh, were basically chock full of, of bodily fluids and blood. Um, so we think about you know trying to combat emerging infectious diseases. Uh, you know we have to understand that people are uh, obviously cash strapped, um, but they also uh, there also could be some facilitation of disease transmission. Uh, through uh, through kind of their their daily regimens um, in Liberia in particular, and this you know goes for most of uh, West Africa. Um, illegal taxi services uh, predominate uh, in the communities, um, so a lot of people basically will just take their own personal cars and use these as illegal taxi services. So this is uh, a highway. Um, so these people are driving. I think it was. I think the speed limit was sixty miles an hour. Um, the car is full of people on the inside. Uh, this car has one person sitting in the trunk. We usually would see two to three uh, sitting in the trunk uh, with, uh, you know, with motorcycles uh, working as taxis. We would see as many as four or five uh, individuals that would be on a, on a single motorcycle. Um, and this is during an epidemic. So uh, these practices, um, you know, talk, in talking to uh, folks that I collaborate with still in that region, um, th there's no ability to, uh, to really try and restrict this at the local level. Um, so without having infrastructure in place or, um, you know, or, or funding mechanisms to try and combat this, um, when we think about things like COVID-19, 
uh, which are able to spread, uh, you know, between people in, in close proximity, much, much better than Ebola. Um, this is what our concern uh, has been. And of course, when we think back to the proximity to wildlife, can't really see it, but in the background, uh, there's a, a little uh, primate um, here. Um, in Liberia, what would happen is that we would have a lot of local children that would sell um, bananas and, uh, and different foodstuffs on the side of the highway, um, but they would always have uh, wild animals with them that they had kind of pseudo adopted. Um, these animals, though, live in the wild and would basically come out and, and stand by the kids during the daytime to try and get uh, food scraps uh, and attention. So all of this comes back to this idea of, like, how do we combat this um, to, to try and reduce disease spread in these regions? Now, I, I'm going to contrast really quickly to COVID-19, but one of the things I want to I do want to mention, when I get into discussing misinformation during COVID-19 and during the pandemic, um, what I want to get across is that this is not something that is brand new. Um, if we go back to, um, you know, to smallpox in the late uh, 1800s, we go back to Spanish flu uh, in 1918 and 1919, um, we, we fast forward now to Ebola in 2014. Uh, misinformation has always been around and, and it's always been guided um, or, or I guess it's always used media to its advantage to try and get um, some of uh, some of the these messages across. Um, but we what we do know is that we still haven't figured out a good mechanism to battle misinformation. And all of these things have ultimately resulted in, in us not being able to uh, to you know potentially curb transmission of infectious diseases as, as quickly as we possibly could. So let's get out of Ebola and talk uh, about COVID-19. Um, so coronaviruses, what, let, let's just kind of go through a short introduction. Uh, I know that uh, I've talked on end uh, about it in interviews. Um, and I know that that all of you folks uh, have probably heard about coronaviruses uh, as much as you ever uh, would, would like to. Um, but I think it's important to, to kind of highlight a couple of things. So uh, coronaviruses are, are members of the coronaviridae virus family. So they're basically their RNA viruses. So their genome is made up of ribonucleic acid uh, in, instead of uh, deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA. So it's a little bit different than what we see in, in our own um, uh, cells in, in our bodies and, and in animals. Um, but they're, the, the genomes of these viruses are fairly large. Um, there are multiple subfamily members, and, and it gets a little bit confusing when we start looking at the, the sheer number of different types of coronaviruses that have been identified. Um, but suffice to say, uh, there, there are multiple coronaviruses that infect humans. So there are, are in fact, actually seven coronaviruses now uh, that we include SARS coronavirus 2 uh, that can infect humans. And really, from the 1960s up until 2002, um, people didn't tend to pay a lot of mind to coronaviruses, uh, specifically because of the fact that they really were related back to, to mild uh, or cold-like illnesses. And we only saw severe respiratory illnesses uh, in people that were severely immunocompromised um, or, or people that, that were, uh, you know, that were quite elderly. Uh, and those events happened, um, you know, very, very often. Um, but everything changed really in 2002 with the emergence of severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus or SARS coronavirus. And then of course changed again with the emergence of MERS coronavirus in, in 2012. Um, so both of these viruses, uh, you know, have, you know, produced, um, you know, epidemics, um, you know, are associated with fairly high case fatality rates. So SARS kills about around 10% of the people that it infects. So somewhere between nine and 10%. Uh, MERS coronavirus, somewhere between 30 and 40% of the people that it infects. Um, but coronaviruses are not restricted just to humans. We actually see coronaviruses, you know, across any number of uh, different uh, different animal species. So that goes everywhere from birds uh, into uh, you know into whales, um, cows, humans, cats, dogs, pigs. Um, so coronaviruses are are fairly um, you know ubiquitous in in nature, um, and that makes it a little bit difficult for us because when we start to think about this idea of viruses that potentially could spill over into humans, we're not dealing with you know, one or two individual coronaviruses. We're actually dealing with a, a fair, you know, fairly large number. And these are just the ones that have been identified. And I'll show some data later to give an idea of how much broader the coronavirus family actually uh, likely is. So I, I talked a little bit about this earlier, 
But, you know, when we think about coronaviruses, we, you know, prior to COVID-19, we thought mostly about SARS and, and MERS. Um, and thinking about, uh, you know, where things started, the likelihood for both SARS and MERS is that everything started in bats. And, you know, at some point in time, there was a spillover of either SARS um, into, uh, into basically palm civets or other uh, smaller mammalian species uh, that, that were traded in, in uh, live animal markets for SARS. Or in the case of MERS, uh, that virus spilled over into camels. We think probably somewhere between three uh, or four decades uh, prior to its emergence in 2012. Um, and what we don't really know is the time period at which uh, these viruses actually circulated in these intermediate hosts before they spilled over into humans. But what we all ultimately know is that whether we're looking at SARS coronavirus or MERS coronavirus, that once that virus got into humans, what we tended to see was that the majority of disease transmission between humans tended to actually happen primarily in hospital settings. Um, so that, that's kind of been important, right? Is that, you know, we, we did see um, and we do see some amount of MERS and SARS being spread through direct contact between people in the community, but it largely has been related to transmission within, within hospitals. And of course, that's quite different now with, uh, with COVID-19. It unfortunately makes things a lot harder for us to figure out how to come at this. Coronaviruses themselves, for, for those that are, uh, you know, kind of uh, interested in the, the science behind uh, the, well, the molecular science behind um, coronaviruses, like, like I am. Um, basically, coronaviruses attach to specific receptors in our cells. So if we think about what a virus actually is, um, I tend to explain viruses as basically looking like a pinata. So we essentially have a hollow shell of protein that essentially is surrounded by basically a layer of fat. And that layer of fat comes from our own cells uh, following uh, infection and following the release of new viral particles back out um, into or, or back out to the, the outside of our cells. And inside this hollow shell of this pinata is basically where that nucleic acid or the genome of the virus sits. So when we think about viruses, they're essentially a, a big, essentially primarily hollow ball of nucleic acid and protein, sometimes with, uh, with a, basically a coating of fat on the outside. Um, so, you know, they're, they're amazingly in, in, I guess, from my perspective, um, they're amazingly simplistic, but the problem is what makes them amazingly complicated is that genome. Um, viruses have been evolving for eons. Um, they've basically been evolving and adapting in the background and they've basically become perfect, um, you know, perfect microbes for being able to infect, uh, very specific types of cells. And in the case of coronaviruses, they have basically antennas on their surface. So on the surface of the actual virus itself, that looks for specific uh, antenna or corresponding antenna uh, called receptors on our uh, host cells. So what that creates is basically a very specific mechanism through which the virus will actually seek out very specific uh, types of cells uh, when, when we get infected. So the virus finds its, uh, you know, its cognate receptor on the on the host cell. Um, that leads to the virus being basically sucked up by the cell. Uh, and once it gets sucked up into the cell, the virus actually opens up and releases its genomic material and its genome into the inside of the cell. So at that point, what happens is the virus actually uses our own host cell machinery to essentially create new viral particles. It's kind of like if, you know, if, listen, I'm, I'm not a car guy, even though, you know, my dad owned a, a, a car uh, or an automobile repair shop for years. Um, I, I could not tell you in most cases, you know, uh, why my car uh, is not working one day. Um, I'm just going to try to keep restarting it. Um, but what I know is if I take my car into an automotive place, basically I'm going to use basically the machinery inside of uh, the automotive uh, dealer um, to, to actually repair uh, my car and getting into working work condition. Well, viruses do the same thing. Um, they don't need to carry all of the, the different machinery to create new copies of, of themselves. They actually can use our host cells against us to do that. And they do that amazingly efficiently.
Um, so I'm not going to go through all the different steps, but ultimately what happens is that the virus infects our cells. Our cells basically create new viral proteins, which ultimately results in the formation of new viral particles, and those get released back out of our cells. So this process is occurring uh, basically in the background of, in, of infection when, uh, when we come into contact with coronaviruses. So let's talk about COVID-19. So COVID-19, uh, basically, you know, the, re the first reports came out about COVID-19 uh, starting on December 31st, 2019. And there was basically these initial reports uh, of a SARS-like illness that had emerged uh, in basically uh, um, uh, what they called a, a seafood wholesale market in, uh, in Wuhan, uh, China, so in Hubei province. Um, this wholesale uh, seafood market actually also housed live animals. Um, so that was, you know, one of the first things that, that we kind of kind of had to work our heads around a little bit. Um, but but they did have a, a fairly broad number of of um, animals that that have been related to different coronaviruses in the past um, at that site. So what was reported on December thirty first was that there was these atypical pneumonia cases that had shown up in in hospitals uh, in uh, in the Wuhan region, uh, and they they referred to be as being SARS like. And I think for uh, infectious disease folks and for emerging virus folks, um, when you hear SARS-like illness, that gets people pretty concerned because SARS emerged in 2002 and then disappeared in 2004. Um, and we have not seen a reemergence uh, over the course of, uh, of 16 years. So this, you know, starts to get some alarm bells going. And in fact, um, you know, so I'm, I'm very fortunate. Uh, we have a 20 month old daughter at, at home. Um, but I also have, uh, you know, uh, the other Dr. Kinderchuk, who is uh, is very tired um, and was very tired uh, by, on New Year's Eve 2019, um, following her mat leave and uh, and going back to work and having uh, our very rambunctious daughter uh, kind of take over our lives. Um, so, you know, kind of fortuitously, uh, I ended up on on social media on Twitter on December 31st and saw this report coming out about this SARS-like outbreak or what they were calling at that point a suspected SARS outbreak in Wuhan. Uh, and I was conversing with Dr. Megan May, who's uh, an emerging virus expert uh, in the US um, uh, in Maine. And uh, Megan and I talked about the fact that, you know, this didn't seem like SARS. Um, it, it just, it didn't have that feeling of SARS. And, and my kind of initial inference was maybe this was something new for influenza. Maybe it was H7N9, which we knew um, was present in the region. Um, but it just, it didn't harken back to that. And, and the reports seemed to suggest that this was something new. And this was, you know, I, Megan and I were not the only people in the world that were talking about, uh, about this on December 31st. This was starting to reverberate fairly quickly through the research community. And, you know, ultimately what happened well, we know where we are now. So cases have spread across the globe um, amazingly quickly. So basically uh, throughout January, spreading throughout um, Asia, and then ultimately as February and March rolled along, spreading across Europe, ultimately to North America and seeding South America as well as Africa. So where are we today? Uh, this is where we are. So, you know, I think back to where we were um, so I spent three weeks in Kenya in January running a science outreach program. And I remember looking at the numbers at that point and thinking, okay, this is not looking great, um, but we still have a chance to get this under control. And as basically we moved into February, um, we saw a bit of a lull period. And I think in, in some cases, um, people started to think that we, we maybe had dodged a bit of a bullet. And ultimately what we saw was that cases started to explode in Europe and obviously, uh, we now see what's going on uh, in um, in throughout the the U.S. and South America, but as well now through uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, um, as well as into uh, the Southeast Pacific. So, uh, you know, we've done very well in Canada, but we are we are nowhere near out of the woods yet. Um, and and this thing continues to grow. And I, I believe yesterday was actually the highest number of new cases that have been reported worldwide throughout the pandemic. So, what what do we know? Um, well, you know, I, I look at this as being the, the time period where scientists and, and researchers and clinicians have really been able to, to shine. Um, I, I feel that in the past six months, we've gained about a decade's worth of information on a brand new virus that we had never seen before. Um, you know, so within basically the first couple of weeks, 
uh, that this virus was reported. So December 31st. So by basically the end uh, of the first week of January, going into the second week of January, we already had the, the genome sequenced for the virus. And we were able to basically identify that this virus likely had emerged from bats. And that was really critically important for us because it gave us an idea of where this virus likely was coming from and ultimately as well started to um, you know, give some, uh, some information uh, for how to try and, and curb um, um, other spillovers. And as well, uh, it gave us information for how this virus might behave based on what we saw with other bat, um, you know, uh, bat coronaviruses like SARS and, and MERS. So what do we know right now? Well, SARS coronavirus 2, which is what causes COVID-19, um, has about 96% um, identity in its genome sequence to another bat virus. So that's why we think that uh, there's a very high likelihood to emerge from bats. But we also see some similarities in the sequence to pangolin uh, coronaviruses. And we've all seen pictures of pangolins. Uh, again, I think they're unbelievably cute, but they harbor uh, and can harbor a number of horrible infectious diseases. Um, but we don't know what role pangolins play yet. So we think that they may be a potential intermediate host. So they may basically be kind of what we think of as an amplifying vessel for the virus that you know, may help facilitate that transmission to humans, but we don't know. What we also have seen in more recent months is that we know now at this point, um, humans uh, can transmit the virus uh, to, uh, to multiple different animal species. So we've seen human to cat transmission. Uh, we have seen some, uh, some information suggesting that humans can pass the, the virus to dogs. And we've also seen human to mink transmission. Um, the unfortunate side is even though with human to cat and human to dog transmission, uh, we, we haven't seen transmission back to humans. In the case of mink, there's a, a growing set of data that suggests that mink can actually pass the virus back onto humans. So this actually complicates the story for us a little bit in terms of how to figure out how to combat this virus as it's spread across the globe. Uh, when we think about infection, uh, what, what do we know? So again, going from the, the standpoint, we didn't know what this virus even was on December 31st. Uh, what we now know is that infection occurs uh, in the epithelial cells that line a respiratory tract. So basically the virus looks for a specific antenna on cells uh, called ACE2, it's a specific protein. Uh, that is found on, on different cells in, in our body. Um, during infection, what happens is that the virus gets taken up into these epithelial cells and the epithelial cells actually have their own immune response. So they actually uh, release in different inflammatory molecules. So things like uh, interleukins that signify to the rest of, of the immune system that the cell is infected, but they also release other things that we call danger molecules that will also basically activate uh, the immune system or the immune responses in surrounding cells. So basically there's kind of this trench warfare that goes on between viruses and, and cells at the level of you know, the, the molecular components within our cells. Um, and this is really how we combat infectious diseases. But we ultimately know that when our cells and our it, basically these epithelial cells uh, in our respiratory tract get infected, we can kind of have one of two potential consequences really comes back to either mild uh, or even asymptomatic infection versus moderate or severe infection. And we're getting a better picture of what that looks like. So in, in basically in mild or, or asymptomatic infection, what we think happens is that our uh, epithelial cells that get infected are actually able to recruit other immune cells very quickly um, to that section of the lung. Those immune cells basically clean out the virus that's that's floating around. Um, but that doesn't happen in, in every individual, in particular, people that have uh, what we call dysfunctional immune responses. So people that are immune compromised, um, people that are elderly um, or, uh, or are battling other infections, um, what we tend to see is that our, their immune responses uh, just don't work as efficiently. And, and we don't specifically know all the reasonings why that happens. But what we think occurs is that in these, you know, this section of the population, um, basically what we get is essentially an over amplification of the immune response. So not only do we have, you know, the virus causing uh, basically our cells to respond and over respond to the infection, 
But those molecules will ultimately lead to recruitment of a lot of other inflammatory or a lot of other immune cells into those sections of the lung that basically exacerbate uh, that inflammatory response. And that can cause a, a number of, uh, of different complications. So we're, I think we're still uh, at, you know, at somewhat of an infancy in understanding all the uh, specific mechanisms for how this occurs, but we're, we're getting a much better gauge on what differentiates uh, mild versus moderate or severe infection. Um, we also have a, a better gauge on how to compare this virus to other viruses. So, uh, you know, I, I, as researchers, we sometimes um, we make, uh, I don't want to say we make statements, um, but we make comparisons um, that maybe uh, don't come across uh, the way that we intend them to uh, with the public. And I think some of that happened in January where, where there was discussion about COVID-19 um, in, uh, in China and what we were seeing in terms of symptoms. And there was a lot of discussion and comparison back to influenza. And, and part of that was to try and, and quell people's fears about whether or not this was actually going to become a pandemic at that point. Uh, you know, there was still some belief that, that it could remain localized in, in China. Um, but there was a lot of discussion about, well, if we look at the seasonal toll of influenza, um, seasonal influenza kills 500,000 people per year. Um, so if we think on the grand scheme of things, um, we have to keep in mind that seasonal influenza um, is also a really horrible disease, yet we don't tend to pay it a lot of attention. And I think in, in, kind of having those discussions, in some cases, uh, people felt that um, that COVID-19 was actually not that big of a deal. Uh, well, you know, we fast forward a few months and what we now understand about COVID-19 is that it actually has, um, you know, a number of factors that, that make it much more difficult to combat than influenza. So first of all, when we look at the number of people that can be infected from an in, in, uh, infected individual with either influenza uh, or COVID-19, so specifically seasonal uh, influenza strains. Um, basically, one infected person with seasonal influenza can infect, uh, you know, approximately one uh, to 1.3 other people uh, surrounding them. COVID-19, the numbers are still uh, varying, so we think that they're probably somewhere between uh, two and three, but we also know that there are people that are actually super spreaders for COVID-19. So these are individuals that can actually spread the virus to a much broader range of people. Um, and we think back to this example of uh, the choir practice in the U.S., where we had one individual that ultimately seeded dozens of uh, different individuals within that choir practice with virus, uh, within a, a, a single choir practice. So these things are, are factors that, that differentiate COVID-19 from influenza. The incubation time for the virus is very different. For influenza, it's one of four days. So within the time period that you're infected, you're likely going to develop symptoms within one to four days post-infection. With COVID-19, it's much broader. It's anywhere from one to 14 days with an actual mean time of about five to six days. Well, that makes things a little bit more complicated because now when we think about people that are exposed or potentially exposed, you know, those people basically could be pre-symptomatic out to the point of up to 14 days um, post being infected. But we also know now that the virus may actually be being transmitted from people that are pre-symptomatic. So in that period between being infected and developing symptoms, they may be able to expose others to virus. Well, since that's such a broad range of time, and in a lot of cases we've been you know, trying to uh, dedicate our testing based on the development of symptoms, this makes it really difficult to try and curb transmission at the source. Hospitalization rates are much higher for COVID-19, so about 19% at the, the time of the writing of this article or the, from this data from CDC and WHO, uh, as well as from NIH. So about 19% as compared to 2% for influenza. And the case fatality rates, um, I, listen, they're up. I, I'm, I'm not gonna make much more of a statement on this aside uh, from saying that the case fatality rates, um, I think are, are still fairly undetermined for COVID-19 and I think are fairly region specific. Um, but what we do know is that we're seeing a growing number of, of fatal infections uh, across the globe. Um, well, we also talk about the, the idea that there is a massive delay when we, when we think about the idea of doing a diagnosis. So somebody going in and actually getting um, you know, a, a diagnostic test for, uh, for COVID-19. Well, what we know based off of you know, this prior incubation time of one to 14 days, most people 
um, are, are likely not going to go in to get a diagnostic check until the point that they show symptoms. Um, and, and obviously that was, uh, you know, what, what has been mandated, um, you know, up, uh, up until this time point for people. So, but the problem is, is that we also know um, that people can actually start uh, transmitting the virus prior to, uh, to getting that, that positive diag diagnostic test and that, you know, prior to uh, developing, um, developing symptoms of disease. So the problem is, is that there's actually this delay between really when a person can actually uh, start to spread the virus as compared to uh, when they may actually show up as being positive on a diagnostic test. And, and this actually, again, makes it very difficult for us to kind of assume where we currently are uh, in terms of the, uh, the spread of infection through the community. Um, this data coming from uh, the US CDC, uh, I think, you know, says, uh, you know, a million words in, in, one, in one figure. Um, we talked a lot in January about the fact that cases in China largely seem at least severe and fatal cases um, seem to be in people that were elderly or people that were immunocompromised. I think the problem is, is that that doesn't really do justice to the problem that, that we deal with with COVID-19. And I, listen, I, I say that as a, a simple virologist, so as a non-clinician, um, so somebody who's not working on the front lines, um, you know, I, I think what we have to understand is that for our healthcare workers, they're dealing with, uh, you know, a truly unprecedented, um, uh, you know, infectious disease. So when we look at hospitalizations across age groups. What we see is that, you know, people that are 20 and above basically have fairly similar rates of hospitalizations. So yes, severe disease and fatal disease, um, you know, it, it seems to still focus primarily on people that are elderly and people that are immunocompromised, but hospitalizations actually occur across all age groups. So when we think about this idea of the toll on the healthcare system and the toll on our healthcare workers, it's not just because of people that, uh, that are in these higher age groups. Um, those hospitalizations occur across all age groups. So, you know, when we think about trying to do messaging for people and combating COVID-19, you know, these are the messages that, that I've really been trying to get across. Well, what, what do we not know about COVID-19? And there, there's still a lot. I, I, will, uh, I will attest to that. Um, one of the key questions is still, when did this virus actually spill over? So this graph is a little bit complicated. It came from a, a study in, in Lancet in January. So one of the first uh, clinical uh, cohort studies in China. But what they were doing was basically looking at that initial cohort of people um, from, the, uh, from the seafood market that had shown up in the hospital. And they tried backtracking to see when, you know, when those people first uh, you know, developed signs and symptoms of illness and how that correlated back to uh, the seafood market. So what I don't want you to focus necessarily on all these, aside from the, to see that you know, these are obviously dates going backwards to December 1st. But right here on December 1st, there is a case of COVID-19 that had no contact with that seafood market. So already in January, what we knew was that this virus had likely been circulating prior to December um, in Hubei province in China. And ultimately, um, some of those cases, or at least that case, was not linked to the seafood market, which meant that we couldn't just focus all of our resources on trying to figure out uh, what animal may have spread the virus uh, at that seafood market. Now, there could have been people that spread the virus at the seafood market, which is what we think occurred, but we think that the likelihood is the virus was circulating in the community prior to that. And there was new data that was released in a preprint the other day that actually was looking at satellite data and suggested that there was actually an increase or a spike um, in traffic at, at different hospitals in the Wuhan region, um, basically in, in early to late fall. Uh, all, of course, all this needs to be validated as to whether or not this correlates with, uh, with increases in things like influenza-like illness in those hospitals, but it suggests that maybe there was actually something going on in the background. The route of transmission, we think, is still primarily through res respiratory droplets, um, but we have seen instances uh, where there's been data to suggest that things like feces or urine um, may actually be at least what we call PCR positive. Virus. So those bodily fluids um, are basically show that the inside of, of the pinata um, is present in those fluids. We don't know if the whole pinata is there, um, which is what we need to infect ourselves, 
but at least a portion of the pinata is. It's kind of like a fingerprint. Um, so we don't know if the you know the individual that matches the fingerprint is there, but the fingerprint tells us that they might be. Um, and, and so we're getting some better uh, some better data on that now. Um, and that's been some of the discussion about this idea of things like uh, fecal to oral routes of transmission, in particular when we think about um, you know kids or in my case our toddler, uh, because we know that that young kids don't tend to show a lot of uh, a lot of disease symptoms. So it's difficult to say whether or not they're infected. What do we know about protective immunity? Right now, we're starting to get a better uh, picture of what this looks like. Um, we know that there are indications that people that uh, recover from disease will develop uh, antibody responses. Um, we don't know how long those antibody responses last for and how protective they are, but the data suggests that at least from what we can see, it looks like what we would expect, that there's some level of immunity that likely is generated um, but that still needs to be to be ultimately validated uh, in, in much larger subsets of, of folks. So we can't yet say whether or not if somebody is antibody positive, so if they do a serology test and they're positive, does that mean that they have protective immunity? We're, I, I just don't think we're there yet. Uh, does reinfection occur? Um, everything that we know so far suggests that no, um, people cannot be reinfected. Most of that comes back to, uh, to basically data in non-human primates that have shown if you take uh, monkeys that are infected with uh, SARS coronavirus 2 and they recover from COVID-19, if you try to reinfect them, they can't be reinfected. We think that some of the positives that have shown up um, after people have been negative for longer periods of time likely has to do with sensitivity issues with the diagnostics. So in, in the last couple of minutes for this, uh, you know, I want to kind of wrap up with this idea of distinguishing misinformation. Uh, and this really started uh, in January. So there was a, a paper that was um, submitted to a preprint server, which basically um, is a, a repository for uh, manuscripts that have been written that have not been peer reviewed by other scientists. So this is basically uh, research groups are submitting this work and basically making it open access to the global research community to vet and provide feedback on. Well, a paper came out that looked at the genome sequences that have been made available and uh, very unfortunately said that they had found um, some indications that there were segments of the HIV genome uh, within that virus. Now, what I can say is within a couple of days, the backlash on the flaws in the analyses caused the authors to withdraw this paper. So they pulled it from publication. Um, Christian Anderson and his group have done an unbelievable amount of bioinformatics work to prove unequivocally that there, this is not a bioengineered virus. Um, the unfortunate side is, you know, uh, five and a half months later, we are still battling with this. Um, I, I cannot tell you the amount of uh, uh, the amount of angry tweets that I get uh, on a daily basis uh, about um, you know people that have basically taken this paper and run with it, and actually feel that the withdrawal of this paper uh, feeds the conspiracy. Well, what we can say when we think about coronaviruses, coronaviruses uh, have been circulating in China um, for, for ages. And in fact, uh, Peter Dysak and Echo Health Alliance just published a, a paper very recently where they showed that in their work, they identified more than 700 new bat origin coronavirus sequences across China. Now, that's pretty astounding considering um, that, you know, we knew of a few dozen, not, you know, not more than, than hundreds. Um, but his work also showed that villagers in Yunnan province that were uh, living in close proximity to bats that, that um, uh, carried coronaviruses, those villagers actually showed uh, about you know, uh, 3% seropositivity for bat coronaviruses. So what that means is that in 3% of the villagers that were tested, bat coronaviruses had actually spilled over and caused those villagers to, uh, to basically generate antibody responses. So coronaviruses are spilling over continually. The problem is, is that once in a while with SARS, with MERS, with SARS coronavirus 2, you get a, a virus that spills over that's actually able to cause infection and is able to transmit between humans. Um, you know, one of the last ones that, that I'll highlight uh, is, uh, is the 5G conspiracy. So there's actually a, a pretty strong group of people across the globe that believe that COVID-19 is actually related to 5G technology and 5G uh, cell towers being put up. And they relate this back to the fact that uh, in 2019, there were 5G cell towers 
that were put up uh, in the Wuhan region in China. Um, and they've gone so far as to basically look back at different uh, pandemics uh, and outbreaks and say, well, if we look at the correlations with all the different uh, radio uh, technologies and uh, cellular technologies that, that have been erected, those have all correlated back with, with outbreaks of disease. And in fact, just simply looking through the dates, the dates don't match up themselves. Um, that being said, I've done multiple podcasts uh, with people that wanted to do interviews about 5G because we've seen people that have been burning down cell towers based on, on this belief. Um, you know, lastly, uh, and I highlight it because I, I also kind of battle with the anti-vax community on a daily basis. Um, there is, again, a segment of the population that believes that diluted bleach uh, is actually what they call miracle mineral solution. So there's a, a, a growing belief that if you basically dilute bleach out in a very specific manner, um, bleach is actually a cure-all for a number of different diseases. And those range from COVID-19 to Ebola to autism. And when I say that these people um, undeniably believe in this, uh, I, I am not lying about that. These, these people um, believe in this uh, with, with their, their full hearts. Um, and, and this has been growing in the anti-vax community and has spilled out into COVID-19. Uh, the simple fact is we know bleach is toxic. We know that the use of dilute, diluted bleach in kids has led to either severe illness uh, or death. But we still see on a daily basis on Twitter, on Facebook, um, these types of, uh, of conspiracies that, that are being spread uh, across the community. And ultimately what this comes back with, I, I think partially is, it, I don't say it's not a failure in science, but it unfortunately comes back to one of the, the problems that we've created for ourselves is that we have basically a, an impetus to try and publish as quickly as possible. And the problem that I've seen with COVID-19 is that we've seen a, a massive increase in the number uh, of COVID-19 related articles that are being released as preprints to the general public. And the problem is, is that again, the data is not peer reviewed. So it's not fail safe. Even when it's peer reviewed, we know it's not fail safe, obviously. Um, but in this case, it hasn't even you know, passed the smell test of other scientists. Well, the problem is, is that once this data gets submitted out um, and once it gets posted on a social media, we're already behind the eight ball with trying to combat misinformation that may come from generalization of those results. So I think we need to find a better way for, for being able to communicate that scientifically. Ultimately, the reason that we're doing all of this is we are in a true race to find treatments for this disease. We have a brand new disease for which we have no underlying protective immunity uh, in, in our population. We have no vaccines. We have no therapeutic. So we need to do everything we can as quick as possible to try and find these mechanisms to, bat, to combat COVID-19 while also not trying to feed those different conspiracies and, and misinformation campaigns. And, and obviously the battle with hydroxychloroquine is a perfect, uh, a perfect example of where we see uh, now politicization of scientific results. So we, we are truly in an, an age where um, we are, are trying to deal with many different factors that are, uh, are essentially locking heads at the exact same time during a public health crisis. So with that, um, you know, I always have collaborators and, and, uh, and people to acknowledge, uh, obviously, my funding sources for, for the work that I do and for giving me the ability to have this platform. Um, but I do want to highlight uh, my work with uh, Dr. Allison Kelvin and Dr. Daryl Falzerano uh, from Dalhousie University and Vito in Saskatoon, respectively. Um, I think that what we've created is a pretty great triumvirate of researchers uh, that, that are um, highly interested and motivated uh, to, to work on COVID-19. And, and I've been so lucky and fortunate uh, to, uh, to be funded along with them uh, to do some of our COVID work, uh, but also to, uh, to learn and, and provide uh, knowledge where and when I can. And with that, I'll answer uh, any questions that you might have. Thank you. Super, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, we have a few questions that have come through. I'll just encourage everybody to go to Slido to post their questions. So the first one is, what is your view on how transparent or not China is being about COVID-19? Uh, so, we, we, so we went right with the, the, the hardest question possible. Um, 
You know, listen, I, I am not going to say uh, by any stretch that that China does not deserve uh, a massive amount of criticism. Obviously, uh, some of the, the information we're, we're starting to glean about the fact that this virus was likely circulating longer than uh, than, than what we know, um, that there, there will be long term ramifications uh, from that. Uh, unfortunately, we're not at a point yet where I think we can actually validate all that data. And we're in this kind of weird position where we need to we need to not stoke the flames because we still need transparency to to some degree uh, with the Chinese government, especially considering the fact we're not through this pandemic yet. So, you know, what happens if we see a resurgence uh, of disease uh, in China, uh, you know, so a, a potential uh, second wave or, or uh, additional waves? Um, we need to basically be working with the global community as transparently as possible to, to try and and uh, not only, uh, you know, hopefully save ourselves, but to to save as many others as we can. So um, there, there have been a number of failures, uh, but I think we, we're seeing that across the globe in different regions. So uh, there there will be uh, a very strong um, you know, message, I, I think, delivered to the Chinese government if it's found that there's uh, there has been a delay in, in reporting. Um, but but I think we, we can't lose the, you know, kind of the, the forest for the trees at this point. Uh, we, we need to do everything we can to combat COVID-19. Okay, so similarly, um, there are reports from the U.S. that COVID-19 transmission from asymptomatic cases may be less prevalent than first thought. What is your view on that? <laughs> yeah, so this this has been the, uh, you know, kind of the bane of my existence the last couple of days. So we, um, again, we we know that uh, different organizations are, um, you know, obviously will, will have kind of missteps in, in how they uh, discuss things and WHO has, you um, you know, has has done that a few times, though I, I applaud them for the work they're doing. Uh, they have come back to try and and kind of you know step back um, the, the statements that they made. But I think a lot of it comes back to this idea of what asymptomatic transmission means. So when we think of asymptomatic infection, we're thinking of somebody that's been infected but never goes on to develop symptoms. So I, I agree that you know asymptomatic transmission is likely not driving the pandemic. Um, it likely occurs. But it probably occurs in a in a small degree of patients, but that doesn't necessarily correlate to pre symptomatic transmission. So during pre that pre symptomatic stage, that incubation stage of infection, when somebody is not showing signs of disease but they're infected, they they don't have any symptoms, so they're asymptomatic, but they will ultimately go out to spread disease. So my my concern with the statements is that. If we put these things out, what it tends to, to create is basically a belief in people that if they don't show any signs or symptoms of disease, that they're fine, that they can go out in public. Well, in fact, we know that pre-symptomatic transmission is actually helping drive the pandemic. So, you know, we, we need to try and still get the message across that for those people that have been in contact with, with people that have been sick with COVID-19 or are or, or, or potentially uh, in, have been in contact, we need people to you know, again, keep that minimum six foot distance between themselves and others, wear a mask if they can't maintain that and, and you know, undergo proper hand hygiene. We, we, we have to try and, and figure out how to not kind of shoot ourselves in the foot with, uh, with our messaging in this regard. Okay, so how confident are you in reported number of cases? Is this hampered by poorer areas of the world where medical care may not be sought and so are cases being missed? Oh, yeah. So really great question, right? And, and talking to, to folks in, in Sierra Leone and Kenya, um, as well as uh, folks in Gabon, um, th this is a real issue, right? So, uh, you know, again, we, we have to understand that in these regions of the world, they, they are facing emerging infectious diseases all the time. Um, coming out of West Africa, coming out of Ebola, um, there is still a fear in the public that going to a healthcare facility uh, basically puts you into essentially a 50-50 chance of stepping back out. Um, so there's still that fear factor that if you go to a hospital, um, you are going to die. And that's one of the issues that, that we need to, you know, kind of gain probably through the longer term, figure out how to communicate better um, at the local and regional level with, with our community partners. Um, but cases likely are being uh, underreported. And we know that even here in Canada, um, we know that the limitation of testing reagents and testing kits really led us to only be able to test those people that that had symptoms. Well, that's probably a very small uh, proportion of the number of people that actually were exposed to the virus ultimately. 
So, you know, what we're hoping over time is that through things like serology testing, where we go out into the community and look for the development of antibodies, what we'll get is hopefully a better sense of how many people were truly exposed during this first wave of infection. And that will give us a better indication of how many true cases of actual infection there were within the communities. And this will be something that will go on across the globe as well. Okay, the next question is, what have we learned from different approaches that countries are taking to battle COVID-19 in the specific countries that are mentioned are Sweden, US and Canada, but you know, essentially all other countries? <laughs> yeah, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll use the US as, as an example first, um, you know, not to try and pick on our Southern neighbors, um, but I, I feel like I, I have some levity because I lived there for seven and a half years. So, uh, I, you know, I, I can make some statements. Um, listen, what, what we're seeing in places, you know, places like Tennessee, California, um, Texas, Florida, um, what we're seeing is a massive upticks in cases very quickly. And, and what a lot of this seems to harken back to is the reduction in social distancing measures before cases had actually truly plateaued. So I think what we can learn very quickly from that is, you know, first of all, Canada has done an amazing job. We, I think, you know, here in Manitoba, we've undergone, uh, you know, reduced social distancing measures um, at a period in time when, when it was safe to do so. And, you know, hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, the numbers kind of stay, stay where they are. We're seeing other regions in Canada that are, that are following suit. Um, but we haven't had that same push to basically just open everything up en masse. Um, and in the U.S., you know what, I, I talk a lot about this idea that there's basically been this kind of blending of a public health crisis and politics. We know we're in an election year in the U.S. Um, so the unfortunate side is that we know the economy is going to uh, likely have uh, an effect in how voter turn or how votes come in uh, for, for the two different candidates. Um, that, unfortunately, also probably plays into some of those decisions. And I think we, we need to figure out a, a mechanism to, you know, to try and, and kind of combat that. With the Swedish example, I mean, you know, folks within Sweden themselves and within the Ministry of Health have said um, now that they probably underestimated uh, COVID-19. They haven't necessarily walked back to say that they made the wrong decisions. But I think what we've ultimately seen as compared to other Northern European regions is that without, you know, uh, you know basically full physical distancing measures being put in place, what happens is that ultimately uh, you, you get more people that are dying and, and you ultimately get a, a greater burden of disease. So I think we, we can look back at, at some of the failures that, that we've made nationally as well as regionally with COVID-19, but we can also kind of give ourselves some applause for the fact that I think we've done very well, uh, you know, as compared to, to the global community. Okay, the, the, the next question is, in your opinion, what is the likelihood that an effective vaccine will be developed? And if so, when? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I had the great pleasure of, uh, of walking past Dr. Tony Fauci uh, nearly on a daily basis when I was at NIH. Um, so I, I have an unbelievable amount of respect for, uh, for, for his opinions and, and his viewpoints. Um, you know, I think that his views on, uh, on the vaccine or, or on having a vaccine candidate um, licensed and, and out to, to being deployed of, you know, being kind of that 12 to 18 month range um, is, is feasible. Um, I think the, the thing we have going for us is that there are a number of different vaccine platforms that are being pursued um, across the globe. And we know that multiple vaccines obviously are in clinical trials at this point. So I, I think that, um, you know, what we're hoping is that maybe uh, some of those, you know, some of those timeframes will backtrack a little bit and may actually come into place a little bit sooner. But when we start to think about the idea of not only passing, say, safety and efficacy standards, but also then going through manufacturing, getting basically doses uh, created in, in millions, and then getting those dispensed out to communities, and then getting people um, to, to be able to come in to get immunized, it's going to take uh, you know, a lion's share of effort. So I think we are still going to be in the, in the clutches of this thing probably for you know, again, I would, I would think, you know, that nine to 12 month range at, at a minimum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is very interesting. This question, will COVID-19 slowly disappear by itself? Can we become immune to COVID? Yeah. So this is a great question, right? And we look back at, at the original SARS coronavirus and MERS coronavirus. Um, what we saw with both those viruses is that people that were exposed ultimately developed some level of protection, but that only lasted somewhere in the network of months to a couple of years. 
So the concern for us with, with COVID-19, especially with you know, the, the fact that we are six months into this, um, and we, you know, we're likely going to be within the clutches of COVID-19 for the foreseeable future, at least through the, the outset of this year. Um, what we have to start to think about is, okay, what happens if immunity only lasts for a year naturally? So somebody that was exposed in January or February, maybe in early 2021, they're no longer immune protected. So I think for us, you know, we, we're kind of in that stage where we don't quite know um, we saw with SARS coronavirus, the original SARS-CoV, that just through proper containment and contact tracing, once we limited the, the ability of that virus to transmit, um, the virus ultimately disappeared, and we haven't seen it spill back over. COVID-19, unfortunately, transmits um, you know, a little bit more widely and a little bit more easily, so that's going to make it more difficult. And I think, if anything, the concern right now is that if we, you know, if without vaccines or therapeutics, ultimately... Um, could COVID-19 become something that becomes endemic like other coronaviruses uh, that cause more mild-like illnesses? So I, I think the jury is still out. Um, and I think we're, we're too early at a stage to really get a gauge on, on what this virus is going to do. It's been unpredictable to this point, and it's probably going to remain unpredictable. Okay, thank you. The next question is, there have been reports that people who've recovered from COVID go on to deal with the linger effects, like lung issues and strange blood work. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, my, my thoughts on this are, um, it, it, it's unfortunate, but I don't think it's completely unsurprising because we've seen this with, again, with, with original SARS coronavirus as well as with MERS coronavirus. And, and we see this, you know, even in my work with, uh, with Ebola virus disease survivors, we see long-term complications in, in those folks that had severe disease. So for, for people that had um, COVID-19, in particular people that had you know, moderate um, or, or severe disease where they were hospitalized, um, I think we're, again, we're, we're at this you know, kind of early stage where people that were infected in China in January are now six months out from being infected, well, I guess five months out from being infected. Um, we're just starting to get a bit of a glimpse of what the long-term picture looks like in those patients. So the likelihood is from some of the data that we've, we've seen being accrued, from different regions, uh, obviously through Europe and, and data being released out from China, um, that there are concerns about uh, potential long-term lingering effects, but we don't quite know what that looks like yet. And at the same time, we're dealing with a, 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 you know, a virus that has now infected millions upon millions of people. So what we're now seeing are you know, even things that, that occur in, in a very, very small proportion of the population. We're seeing obviously larger numbers and a higher representation of that because of the fact that we're seeing so many infections as compared to seeing MERS or, or SARS. So we may have also seen these, these types of ailments in those diseases, but they just got washed out because they never spread as far. So I, I think the likelihood is that yes, we're gonna see long-term complications. We don't know what the picture looks like, but we're getting a better picture as 2020 continues onwards. And so similarly, it's sort of a follow-up question, is from the point at which a person is infected, how much time must pass before a test for COVID-19 will reliably detect this infection? Yeah, that's a great question, right? So one of the things that, that has come out recently is we think, or at least uh, no, say we, I'll, I'll say we on behalf of the research community, um, we think that basically uh, the highest viral loads, the highest amount of infectious virus that a person is carrying occurs kind of at their peak of illness. So the, basically at the, the point of illness where they have the worst symptoms. So what that means for, um, you know, for us from say um, things like a, a testing perspective is that the likelihood is the most reliable test is going to be that which kind of fits that perfect period when somebody has the greatest amount of virus uh, with, within that sample, which also correlates with the highest amount of symptoms. Now, the problem is, is that somebody that is mild or a mildly symptomatic versus somebody that is severely ill, those things are going to look very different. So the problem that we get into is this, you know, this idea of, well, when do you go to get tested? Well, we know right now, if somebody is not symptomatic, even if the virus is kind of incubating in the background, the likelihood is, is that those people will probably test negative. Um, but that's a false negative. The virus is there. It's just at too low of a level to be picked up by the diagnostic assay. Um, you know, so the, you know, I think the same, um, the same recommendations that have, you know, been made for, you know, the, the past few months still stay in place that people that have had close contact with somebody that, that has had COVID, um, or, or may have developed symptoms of COVID, those people should self-isolate. 
And if and when, you know, and obviously and that still goes for 14 days at that point, but if they develop symptoms, that's the point where, uh, where we want to see people asking for, for tests. And, and tests will increase uh, in, in numbers over time as, as more testing kits become available, but they're still going to focus primarily on those people that are symptomatic first. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a number of questions still. Um, what do you think might be an effect of intensive livestock operations on possible future spillovers to humans? Yeah, so this is such a great question, right? And, and it's something that uh, you know that that we talk about uh, a lot in, in my lab and as well with um, you know with folks that I collaborate with. So when we think about this idea of people that are in close proximity to wildlife, um, what we do know is that you know a lot of a lot of different livestock species um, are potential mixing vessels. So or uh, mixing vessels. So we think about things like poultry. We know for influenza viruses that poultry are a mix, uh, mixing vessel for uh, for different influenza viruses. Same thing with swine. So we know that people that work in close proximity uh, to that type of livestock um, you know, are probably at a greater likelihood of, of getting infected. Now, there's environmental conditions to, to take into account, which is why when we look at influenza, you know, the majority of kind of highly pathogenic influenza viruses uh, have tended to emerge in Southeast Asia. Um, with coronaviruses, again, we have you know, we're getting, I think, a better picture. And I think Peter Dizak and Echo Health's Alliance work um, in China looking at bats is a perfect example where the more that we start to do surveillance in, in wildlife, the more that we start to pick up these viruses and we start to figure out, okay, is it all bats or is it actually just specific species of bats in this region because of the environmental factors um, that, uh, that come into play? And if we can understand that aspect, what we can start to do is hopefully guide people um, with their livestock practices. So we think about things like Nipah virus that emerged in, uh, in 1999 in Malaysia. Um, that spilled over from bats into pigs and ultimately spilled over from pigs into humans. If we can try and increase essentially that distance between bats and those potential uh, incidental hosts that could essentially amplify the virus and, and, uh, and transmit it to humans, hopefully that will be enough to curb transmission because ultimately with these viruses that, that are found in species like bats, we're not gonna be able to, um, uh, to eradicate them like we did with smallpox. Because in, by the time we eradicated smallpox, it was only found in humans. So as long as we try to immunize all humans, um, the virus couldn't basically uh, transmit uh, any longer. With these other zoonotic viruses, unless we can actually cut the, the virus off at, uh, at the, the actual animal itself, the virus is still going to circulate in the background. The best we can do is try and stop that spillover event. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, if RNA is so fragile in the environment, how can it be detected in things like sewage? Yeah, so this is a great question, right? And it comes back to, you know, listen, thankfully, a lot of RNA biologists are far smarter than me. Um, which is why I rely on, on a lot of their data. What we know with nucleic acid, though, is that um, so RNA is, is fairly fragile. It, it breaks apart, but it doesn't break apart necessarily down to the single nucleotides. What it will do is, is likely breaks down into smaller pieces, and those pieces may actually be able to form different types of secondary structures that maybe make them a little bit more resistant um, to things in the environment and to degradation in the environment. So when we do things like uh, these different types of diagnostic assays, these qPCR assays, what we're really looking for is a small fragment of that genome as opposed to the whole genome itself. So even if we get a positive test, it doesn't necessarily tell us for certain that there's infectious virus there. So like, you know, again, my, my work with Ebola patients, we look at Ebola virus persistence uh, in the testes of, of males that survive. And we know that we're able to detect RNA um, of Ebola virus in those survivors um, out to, in some cases, more than 40 months in their semen. But that doesn't necessarily tell us that it's infectious virus. So, you know, we're able to utilize basically some of, you know, the, um, the resistance to, to, to full degradation by RNA to use it as, uh, you know, uh, basically a hint or an alarm bell that there may be something there but then we have to go basically the extra mile to identify if there is actually that whole live virus or that whole infectious virus or that whole pinata actually in, uh, in those samples. Okay, thanks. Um, the next question going back to, to politics is how important
in the U.S. in the U.S. was Trump's disbanding of a committee or panel that was planning on how to deal with future pandemics. Last, <laughs> yeah, this is uh, uh, how, how do I say this without uh, w- without you know trying to, to grimace or or say anything untoward? Um, I, listen, I, I think it had a, a massive effect, right? And, and I, I was I was lucky enough to be in the U.S. during the the Obama years. Um, you know, there, there were obviously uh, problems with some of their response efforts. Uh, you know, we, we saw that in uh, in some of the uh, the 2009 H1N1 response. But by the time that Ebola came around, uh, you know, they, they had a really great uh, committee for dealing with pandemic preparedness. And ultimately, we, we know that those recommendations were in place with how to deal uh, with pandemics as they uh, would potentially arise, as opposed to trying to deal with them you know, three or four months following spread. And a lot of that, again, uh, harken back to this idea of putting focus on vulnerable regions of the world and the importance of putting investment in those regions. So uh, ultimately, listen, my feeling is, is that it, it's had a massive effect. And, and if anything, what we've seen, um, the, the effect has really been that there's been a division along political lines with how serious, uh, in many cases, how serious they feel COVID-19 is. And that's the unfortunate side that we don't want to be in when we're battling a pandemic, especially during the early stages, and, and you know, with something that's unpredictable. Um, when we get people that are divided uh, and we're seeing further division, um, how do we then come back if there's a second wave to get people to adhere to public health uh, recommendations, to, um, you know, to, to go back into lockdown or to go back to social distancing? So I, I think it's had a, a, just a, an amazingly deleterious effect. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. We just have time for maybe two more questions. Um, the next one is, how will scientists determine the efficacy, including the long-term efficacy of antibodies in preventing infection in the person who has these antibodies? Yeah, this is a great question, right? So one of one of the things that we can do is, there's a couple of things. One is, we can actually do different molecular tests with antibodies. So if we get um, a serum sample from a patient, what we can do is we can actually look to see whether or not um, those antibodies will do what we call neutralize the virus uh, in cell culture. So in my laboratory, you could do basically a a very quick test to see whether or not the antibodies that are within that person's serum um, are actually able to essentially inhibit the virus from being able to infect cells. So those are kind of quick fixes for us. The other thing that we can do is we can actually kind of go back to bringing in animal models of, of, of infection and I know that there is still definitely in the U.S., um, you know, a, a community that feels that we should not be doing animal testing. And I, I understand to a certain extent their, their feelings. Um, but the fact is, when we're dealing with an emerging disease, we know that we don't necessarily have again, that levity to be able to wait to see whether or not people that were infected in this first wave ultimately get infected in the second wave. Well, what if we can you know, show in non-human primates that if we infect them with SARS coronavirus 2, they basically develop uh, a disease that looks very similar to COVID-19. And in fact, if those animals and when those animals recover, if we go back to reinfect them, you know, weeks, months, or years after they were initially infected, are they still protected? And we can use that again as somewhat of a guide for us uh, with being able to uh, to demonstrate whether or not, um, you know, we we actually see see protection. And, And again, we can always go back to the communities. If we see subsequent waves of infection, if we have you know, data recorded for which patients were uh, initially infected during the first wave through contact tracing, um, we can look to see whether or not those people or their, uh, their potential household contacts were ultimately infected again during the second wave. And that again gives us some idea of whether or not they've been protected. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the latest, most reliable information on SARS coronavirus 2 viability on and the transmission via various services versus face to face transmission? <laughs> yeah, great question. So I, I actually uh, had a, a CTV Winnipeg interview this morning at 7 30 that asked this exact question. So where are we? We're, we're still in the same place we were, um, you know, probably about a month and a half ago. So uh, the Rocky Mountain Labs in Hamilton, Montana, which is part of the NIH. Um, uh, through Vincent Munster's group had actually done some pretty amazing work looking at surface stability of of the virus. And what we know is that basically the smoother the surface, so things like glass um, or ceramic, the longer that virus could remain infectious on that surface. But 
what we need to keep in mind is that when we start to think about things like environmental factors, so temperature differences, um, uh, you know, sunlight, rain, um, wind, all these factors will have uh, basically uh, negative effects on the viability of that virus. So we, we still think that ultimately, probably the 24 hour range is what we're looking at. But what we don't truly know is how much virus you would need on a spot on a surface to actually infect somebody. So if I touch my counter and then touch my eyes, how much virus needs to be there for me to get infected? Now that's different from somebody that is within say, you know, a couple of feet of me and happens to cough because those people likely, or if they speak loudly, if they expel any kind of respiratory droplet, they're likely carrying a much higher burden of virus on those droplets that I'm gonna be exposed to. So what we can ultimately say is that contact transmission um, likely leads to some amount of infection, but the likely driver of the pandemic is still person-to-person -person contact. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kinderchuk. Unfortunately, that's probably all the time we have for questions. So I'm sorry to everybody who, whose questions we couldn't get to, but thank you very much for your very interesting and very timely presentation. Thank you to all of you who've been listening and participating in asking questions during this last hour and a half. Uh, just a reminder that we will be posting a recording of today's session on our website, as well as sen sending you a follow-up link to a survey where you can share your thoughts and feedback. And please to do provide feedback as it's the only way that we're able to improve. Next week on June 17th, our speaker will be Dr. Suzanne Gagnon. She is the Canada Research Chair in Leadership Education, Assistant Professor in Leadership and Organization, and Director with the James W. Burns Leadership Institute here at the University of Manitoba, who will speak on crisis leadership observations for a new model. Just a reminder, we do have three sessions left, including next week on the 17th. We also have a session on June 24th and a bonus session on Tuesday, June the 30th, all of which are starting at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Please do visit our website to register for these sessions if you haven't already through Eventbrite. Uh, in the spirit of sharing more Learning for Life opportunities, we will also be sending you an email about this tomorrow, but we're excited to share that on Friday, June the 12th, that's this Friday, uh, you can join the University of Manitoba Faculty of Science at 3.30 p.m. Central Time, where you will hear from Nobel Laureate and UM alumnus, Dr. James Peeble, who will be presenting on lessons on the nature of physical science from the study of the expanding universe. And as I said, we'll be emailing you with some details tomorrow about that. So with that, have a wonderful week and please stay safe. Thank you.